Okay, we're back again. Let's uh, finish out the upper extremity and uh, we got down to uh, the middle portion of the humerus. So let's talk about the elbow, the forearm, and the hand, okay? And we'll go from there, okay? Um, the humerus, okay, let's talk about the distal humerus first of all. That's a good place to start. Um, basically, th th there are a couple of very important points that we want to look at at the distal humerus, okay? And let me just start out showing you. This is the anterior view right here, and this is posterior. So this is looking from the front. This is looking from behind over here. There are a couple parts that are really exceptionally critical. First of all, this part right here. This part right here is called the capitulum, okay? If you look at it, it looks like a round ball, okay? If you see the word cap, cap means caput or, uh, ca you know, uh, um, capitate, ca ca you know, everything is, ca everything a cap, uh, everything that has a cap on it has to do with something with, the, with, the, with a rounded area, because my head's round, because cap means head, okay? Uh, so if you see cap on something, it usually means a rounded type of a process, okay? So this is called the capitulum, which is sort of rounded, which makes sense because what we're going to see in a couple minutes is it articulates with the next bone distally, which is going to be the radius, and the radius has a disc-shaped head that's a little bit concave at the top. looks like this. It's a little concave at the top, okay? And as a result, that little concavity fits around that roundness, that convexity of the head of the capitulum. Okay, so I think that that's important. So the rounded head or the rounded knob. Now this is also, we've got to remember that this is lateral. The radius, if we're in anatomical position, the radius is lateral, the ulna is medial. Okay, radius, so this is lateral and this would be medial over here. Okay, so basically that area on the lateral side of the distal humerus is called the capitulum, which is rounded to make uh, articulation with the uh, the head of the radius, which is a mildly concave concave surface. Okay, so that's one thing I think you should know about down here. Let's get rid of this stuff here. The second thing I think that's really important to understand here is something called the trochlea. Now, trochlea means spool, means spool. Okay, and so let's look for something that looks like a spool. Oh, there it is, right there. See, it looks like a spool. That's a spool. That's called the trochlea. We see that both anteriorly and we see it also on the posterior side because of the posterior view. That's the anterior view. It's called the, 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 the trochlea. Okay. And it, basically, it's because it's spool shaped, the ulna, which is going to be, again, medial, ulna is going to be medial, radius is going to be lateral. Okay. That spool shaped here fits in what's called the trochlear notch in the ulna, which looks like this. So here's the ulna that's just like that. So this is a little trochlea or spool area is going to fit right in this notch. So we have uh, like like a hinge joint. We, it's, it's a perfect example of a hinge joint. It goes to the back because that hinge has to go all the way around. Okay. So where we had the capitulum on the lateral side, which is round, we have the trochlea on the medial side, which is spool shaped. The capitulum is round because it, it articulates with the mild concavity of the radial head. And the trochlea is spool shaped because it fits inside this little trochlear notch on the ulna. Perfect, okay? So I think that those are two things that are really critical to understand. I think get those down right now because they're they're gonna come back and, and haunt you a lot of times, okay? A couple other things I wanna show you here, okay? Is there's a couple other depressions. Now we talked about a depression in bone is called a fossa, fossa. You should know that word by now. It's called the fossa. There are a couple of fossas we need to talk about here. Only one on this slide. There's going to be one coming up next slide. First one I want to talk about is this one right here. Okay. And that's called the olecranon fossa. The olecranon fossa. Let me go dread that 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 radi that ulna again. Looks like this. Well, this part back here we know is called the olecranon. And that olecranon. You know, you, that if you were, you know, lay person, that funny bone, that little bump at the back of the elbow. Well, think about it. I want you to bend your elbow this way, okay, and feel that bump. Feel that bump. Now, what I want you to do is keep your fingers on that little, on the olecranon, and I want you to sort of extend your elbow. Continue and extend it, extend it, extend it, extend it, extend it. All of a sudden, it's almost gone. Where did it go? Okay. What it did was, when I extend my elbow, that olecranon then fits inside this little, Electronon fossa, right here, and so that we, we don't get that same prominence that we get with the with the with the elbow extended as compared to with, with the elbow flex. So that's called the electronon fossa. Okay, we also have over here this little area right here, and that's called the coronoid fossa. The coronoid fossa. Now let's look down here at my rudimentary, very rudimentary drawing of an ulna. Okay, here's that trochlear notch right in here. Okay. 
but at the front at the anterior portion is this little bump okay that little bump or that little beak there is called the coronoid process the coronoid process so you can't really feel it very well but if I take my elbow and flex my elbow up I have to have some place for that little bump to go when my elbow gets flexed up when this area is moving up this way towards the humerus which is sitting there I have to have some place for that little bump to go where is it gonna go it sits inside that little coronoid fossa right there perfect okay one other little area I should show you okay one other little area I want to I want to show you here as well right here is a little area it's called the radial fossa okay now that radial radius like radial head I mentioned was like a like a little disc what happens is when I flex the elbow up the top of that disc has somewhere to go where is it gonna go it goes in that radial fossa so when the elbow is flexed this way I have to have a place for the coronoid process to go where does it go it goes in here goes in here and when I when the elbow is flexed I have to have a place for that radial head to go where does it go it goes in here okay in here and if I have a place for my uh, electron when I may elbow is extended I have to have a place for my electron to go where's it gonna go it's gonna go in here okay so that's the electron fossa the coronoid fossa and the radial fossa to go along with the uh, capitulum for the articulation between the humerus and the radius and the trochlea for the articulation between the humerus and the ulna okay a couple other things I just want to show on this on this diagram here before we head on which is going to come up again down the road let me just get rid of all my scratchings here okay I'm not really a very good artist but I'm a lot better than what's actually you see on these things but a couple other things I want to show you here that I think are, are really important first of all we know that this is medial this is lateral this is medial this is lateral okay how do I know because the radius is lateral on is medial okay and basically the capitulum is going to sit is is going to sit uh, over here if you look at this little round area right there that's where the capitulum would be but we see it because it's on the front front more on the anterior portion of the humerus okay um, so therefore what happens is is when we look at the end of a bone we talked about the end of a bone being called the condyles the distal articular surfaces are called the condyles so basically for all practical purpose this is a condyle that's a condyle this is a condyle that's a condyle okay if we look on the top there's something that says medial epicondyle which is right here and right here and lateral epicondyle which is right here and right there okay now epi means upon so this is the area of the bone upon the condyle and why is that significant you say well it's just a little area of the end of the bone no it's really significant it's really significant because it's an area if you look at it and you sort of maybe get a little bit of the impression here that the bone is sort of rough when you see bone that's rough and has like little lumps and bumps and little depressions and small little holes and like pinpoint holes in it, it means something's attaching in there okay now if you take your elbow okay and I'm gonna have to get in, get in the video view right here if I take my elbow and pull my wrist back pull my wrist back now feel over the lateral aspect of my elbow and you feel how the muscles there get tight what happens is the muscles that come from the back of my hand that go up the back uh, the posterior aspect of my forearm they attach to my lateral epicondyle and that would be this area right here or this right here it depends on if I'm looking from for a fact if you ever heard of tennis elbow tennis elbow is also called lateral epicondylitis because what happens and as they're as they're playing tennis and they pull, pull their hand back what happens it tightens those muscles and they get a tendonitis right where the tendon attaches right here right here lateral epicondylitis okay and so that's why that's important now you say well the lateral, what's about the medial epicondyle you know it has to do something sure it does now take your forearm and now instead of pulling your wrist backwards pull your wrist forwards now feel at the medial aspect of the humerus right here at the elbow and you feel how those muscles are getting tight and that's where inflammation that people would get this area which is my medial epicondylitis or sometimes called little leaguer's elbow um, if you're um, I was a baseball player in college and I was a catcher and what happens is when somebody's throwing a, a curveball the idea is they snap their arm they, they, they rotate their hand in a, in a geez, I gotta stand 
like this, which actually brings their wrist for or their forward, okay, and it tightens up those muscles. Well, in kids, there's a little growth plate or secondary ossification center that would be at that area right in here. This little part of the bone doesn't come in until late, okay? This part right here and this part doesn't come in until late. As a result, it starts to pull and tug there. So when people are throwing, like, say, you know, tell kids, hey, don't throw a curve until you're a little bit older, you know. Well, you know, I mean, a little bit's okay. But, you know, what happens, it causes that growth plate to become irritated and they get what's called a medial epicondylitis. So the medial and lateral epicondyles are areas where muscles will attach. And that's going to come up in another slide here, okay. And again, this is the epicondyles, epicondyles we're talking about. Here's my medial epicondyle right here right here, okay, and my lateral epicondyle is over here, okay, there's lateral epicondyle, lateral epicondyle, here we talked about that, and basically if you look at that, there's just uh, a, a point just for, uh, uh, the, 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 where all the little muscles will, will attach into the, the tendon, because, you know, tendon attaches muscle to bone, okay, so that's a little bit about that. Uh, Interesting portion that I want to also point out right here, because again, you know, baseball. I mean, I like all kinds. Of, I like, I like, you know, I, I have to say, probably my favorite sport is going to be hockey. Uh, I, I love baseball. I love football. I love lacrosse. Lacrosse is a great, great game as well. I, I like basketball, but it's not in my top three. Um, uh, but let's go back to baseball because baseball was what I probably played the most of. Okay, I've played hockey, I've played, I've played a little bit of everything. But um, baseball was was an area that that I, I was more studious about. Okay, I could be one of those you know baseball nerds. Have you ever heard Tommy John surgery? Okay, the thing about Tommy John surgery is this little area right here. See what says ulnar nerve sulcus. Well, let me get it so I could draw here. See what says ulnar nerve sulcus. This little area right here. Okay, there's a, a nerve that comes right back in there. You know, you, we hit your elbow and all of a sudden, you, uh, I, I bang my funny bone and stuff like that. Well, right back here on the, on, let's see, I got hard to point it. Right here, it's on the medial side. Okay, you can feel that groove. You can feel the medial epicondyle here, that little bump that would be right at this point. But right next to it, there's a groove. What sits inside that groove is the ulnar nerve. I can prove that to you. Okay, all you got to do is sit there and bang on it for a while and your fingers are going to go crazy. Okay, your little finger and your, part of your ring finger and it's got to hurt. And gonna, no, I didn't do it. Don't do that. Someone out the dean will call me and say, hey, you're, you're hurting your kids or something like that. But anyway, what happens is um, uh, with, with pitchers, um, that, they get a lot of scar tissue that will form right in that area around the, the nerve as it goes to that little groove. And as a result, what happens is the ulnar nerve goes to the hand. And it provides sensation, okay, to the little finger. And this, only this part, the little finger side of the ring finger, not this part, this part right here. So they get numb in their little finger and part of their ring finger. But what's also even more devastating is that ulnar nerve for the muscles, it, 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 it does this. It goes to the muscles that will actually abduct and adduct the fingers. So therefore it becomes difficult to be able to actually hold the ball or grip your fingers together to be able to hold the ball to be able to throw it. So as a result, they lose, they can't hold the ball very well. They get numbness, they don't get a feel of the ball. So what they actually do is they'll actually go in surgically in that little tunnel that's right here, okay, and find the nerve, strip off as much scar tissue, and then try to replace the nerve so it's to replace the nerve so it's it's over on the side a little bit. So it's not going to be in that groove and running in that groove and kind of cause more irritation. Okay. So that's another thing there. So we know the epicondyles, we know that that ulnar sulcus and stuff like that. We already talked about the coronoid fossa, and here's the coronoid fossa like we talked for that coronoid process. And we already talked about the electronon fossa, which is back in here. So we're we're pretty good. You know, everybody we're all on the same page at this point. Uh, this is just looking at the elbow again, and and again here's the here's the capitula, uh, capitulum which is round. Here's the head of the radius which is sort of disc shaped, little concave on the top, and then here's the here's the coronoid process. See the coronoid process right here of the of the ulna. So this would be an anterior view. This would be the trochlea. There's the capitulum. Okay, so the trochlea is in blue, and the capitulum is in red okay and this is looking posteriorly so there's a posterior view and you can see here's the here's the um, uh, the olecranon and you can actually see the olecranon fossa sitting above it okay you can actually see a little bit over here if you look right in here you can see the head of the head of the radius 
and the capitulum right there. Okay, and you can see a little bit where the uh, where the anterior portion of the joint for the all the ulnar humeral joint would be in there. But that's basically looking at the elbow on a very basic drawing. Okay. And this pretty much tells about this about the same thing we saw before, but just going a little bit more distal. So we're just getting it from, you know, looking at it a little bit different. Again, there's the there's the capitulum and the trochlea and stuff like that. You've seen that, so you're in good shape with that. This is just looking. Uh, where's it going? Uh oh, I'm losing my picture. Oh no, I'm not. That's too far away. Okay, let's blow those puppies up. Now what we're doing here is we're looking. Here's anterior. Here's anterior, and this is posterior. And this is a you know real live bones, okay? So well they're not live anymore. <laughs> yeah, somebody donated them, I guess. Okay, here I have my arm. Anyway, so if we look right here, here's the capitulum, right here. See how it's round, you know? So that's see right there. So that round area, the capitulum, is right there. You can see that. Whoops. And then uh, the trochlea would be on the other side. So I can't go back. You can, you can go back and look, and you can see the trochlea. If I'm looking here, I can see here's the humerus. This is distal humerus. And here's the capitulum. Here's the trochlea right here. Here's the uh, tro trochlear notch. Here's the coronary process right there. Here's the head of the radius sitting right there. Here's the electron process right there. Okay, so pretty much what we've seen so far. And this just shows you the same thing we showed again from that previous picture that left me too fast, okay? Uh, if I touch the wrong spot, sometimes they go crazy. It's, I don't know. But anyway, if you see what happens is here's my radius. At this point, here's that disc-shaped head of the radius, which is going to go to the area of the capitulum right there. And here's that trochlear notch, which is going to go and fit inside the trochlea right there. So what's it going to do? That one's going there. That one's going there. Love it. Okay. So now we're in good shape. So everybody should know all that. No, you should know that. You should know that, and you should know all the fossas, and and you, we, we're, we're good. Okay. If you don't, go back and look at it, and you'll be able to see. These are some radiographs to show you what we're talking about here. Um, if we look here, here's the here's the radial head. Let me just draw the radial head in here. Here's the radial head sitting right here. Again, it's a little concave. And then on the other side of it, you see the capitulum, which is round. Perfect. Okay. Now here you could see the olecranon sitting right here. And you can't really tell the, the coronoid process really well. And I don't like the fact that they drew these lines in here. But it's right here. Here's the guy that's drawing all the lines, all these things. One thing I want to talk to you about right now, that's probably, this is a good time as any to, to be able to talk about it, is something called super imposition. Superimposition is just a fancy medical term for meaning one bone is superimposed upon another. Okay? When they take an x ray, what happens? What happens is when the x-ray beam leaves the tube to go towards a film or a plate that's going to record how much beam gets there, the harder something is, the more that beam is stopped and it doesn't get to the plate, which then causes a reaction on the plate. The harder something is, the whiter it is. Okay? So in other words, the more dense, and actually, I, I even hate to say, say word hard, I'd rather say dense. The denser something is, the whiter it is. Because if it's dense, the radiation beams don't don't pass through very well. Things that are less dense, more beam goes through, and then all of a sudden we have more of a gray. So if you look at this X right here, you know, you see some areas that are whiter, some areas that are grayer, some areas that are really black. Oh, like this out here, you know, this area out here is really black. Why? Because that's all air. There's nothing stopping it out there. But if I look at the area where the electron is and the and the ulna, it's whiter than the area of than this part of the of the humerus than this part of the humerus. If you actually look also at this area right here, what do you see? That's the electron fossa. That's part of it. That's the superior portion of the electron fossa. Why? Because the bone is going to be a little bit less dense there because there's a depression. Okay, the more bone, the more dense it's going to be. And also the more tightly packed it is, more cortical bone, the more dense it's going to be. That's why the outer rim of a bone is going to be whiter than the inner portion in here, because the inner portion is more cancellous trabecular bone, where the outside is more cortical, dense, hard, compact bone. What we see here is when we look at this, I'm going to get rid of all my drawings, or all my little lines that I drew on the screen here. Okay, can get rid of all that. 
And what happens is you see how white this is, okay? If I start to look at this area, it's much whiter. And the reason why it's much whiter is that's the electron superimposed over the area of the distal humerus, so it's whiter. More, the, the radiation beam, the X-ray beam, has to go through more, more, more bone to be able to get to the film or to the plate. Okay, so that's what we call superimposition. But what am I trying to say? What I'm trying to say is when we look at an X-ray, an X-ray is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional object. Some things are going to be in front, some things are behind, but I don't see things coming out of the screen. The only way I could assume that is by, it's not upper position, I, first I lost my S, super, superimposition. What happens is the only way I could imagine how things are sitting in front is because of the densities. So in other words, if that's wider, I know I have two bones, one on top of the other that's creating that increased density, which means that some things I might not be able to see as well. It says here coronoid process, but you know what? I really have a difficult time seeing this. I know that's what the coronoid process is going to be, but I can't really see it. Okay, and this is going to be something that we're going to see time and time again. What my recommendation is is when you get to these videos, stop and look at these videos, stop and look at the X-rays, and try to relate where everything is. Okay, because again, there's not there's not going to be a little sign when you take an X-ray of somebody that says that's the electron on process. You just have to know where it's at. So you have to know what these things look like. Now, now we're looking at a lateral view. Now, the lateral view shows me a lot of good things here. Okay, here's that trochlear notch. Here's that trochlear notch that we'll be sitting right there. Here's the electron on process right in here, okay? This is this is called the supracondylar ridge. On the side of the humerus, there's a ridge that comes down both sides that actually end up at the lateral and the medial epicondyle, okay? Here's the capitulum, okay? It's down in, in this area. It's sort of superimposed with the area here, which is gonna be the trochlea. So like the trochlea is sitting here, and where's the capitulum? It's behind it. So therefore, we see the same thing. Here's my radial head right here, okay? Here's, here's the uh, coronoid process. Let me draw that in a different color. Here's the coronoid process right here. So I can see that now. Let me just take these away so you can actually see without my scratchings on here. And you can see the things. So you can see the trochlear notch. You can see the electron process. You can see the capitulum. You can see the uh, coronoid process. You can see the radial head. You can see the, the uh, elbow joint. The elbow joint is this area right there, that little darker line. It's in there. Why is it darker? because that area is filled with cartilage. Cartilage is not nearly as dense as bone, okay? So that's what we see when we look at that. A couple of the things we see down here is something here, or actually you see one thing here, it's called the tuberosity or the radial tuberosity. There's gonna be one in the ulna. You can't see it. Actually, yes, you can a little bit, I'm wrong. You can see a little bit of it right, whoops, right here. There's a little bit of a bump if I um, get rid of that. See how it sort of like bumps up a little bit right there? Let me just draw like an arrow where it's going to go. Right there is right the center of that little hump. And that would be the area of the uh, ulnar tuberosity. And I'll explain the importance of that in just a second. Okay? Let's look at another one. Now we're looking at another one here. And you can see all these same things. All these are really well. You can actually see very well the electron fossa. See how it's less dense? Because it is... There's not as much bone to have to go through. You can see the electron process sitting inside that electron. You can see the medial epicondyle because I know ulna is on the medial side. I can see my lateral epicondyle because I know the radius is on the lateral side. Here's my radial head right there. Here's the radial neck. The neck is going to be right here. Okay, so there is going to be the neck. Here's that radial tuberosity. Going to be there. You can't see the ulnar tuberosity, so it's covered up. The trochlea. Here's the, actually, you can see the capitulum. Okay, let me just draw that in a different color. The capitulum is right there. Okay, and then you can see the trochlea. Here's that, sp here's that spool shaped area right there. So here's the trochlea sitting right there. This area right here would be the area of the coronoid process. Okay, so let me get rid of my lines. I'll let you zero in on that just a second. Okay, so all those things you should be able to identify. Uh, the medial epicondyle, the electron process, the trochlea. You can actually see the joint, okay? Um, you can see the uh, radial tuberosity. You see the neck of the radius, the head of the radius. Uh, again, the, the joint, the capitulum, uh, the lateral epicondyle, and the electron fossa. You should see all those things. Those little things are, are pretty obvious, and you can see those pretty easily, okay? That's an easy x-ray to see those from. This one's not a great one, okay? The only reason why I actually bring this one in is actually because, you know, you can see the medial epicondyle sticking out like a sore thumb, okay? But that was not a good one. Let's talk a little about the uh, radius and the ulna. Let's talk first about the ulna. Again, 
everything that we talk about is in anatomical position. So the ulna we know is on the medial side of the forearm. Okay, ulna is medial, radius is lateral. Ulna medial, radius lateral. You should know that. Okay, uh, what are some of the parts of that ulna that we should know about? First of all, the olecranon. You know, so this area back here is the olecranon process. That bump you feel at the back of the elbow. That's easy to know. The trochlear notch is that area. And what's the trochlear notch for? To fit around the trochlea, because the trochlea is like a spool shaped, spool shaped, shaped joint. That's the articular portion of the of the ulna. We see the coronoid process. Where's the coronoid process? Right here. And so you can actually see it with this little hump of bone that sticks up right there. So this right there. Is the, same, is the same as that, just looking at it from the side versus looking at it from the top, okay? And then we do see that ulnar tuberosity right here, okay? Ulnar tuberosity, it's not nearly as big as the radial tuberosity, but it's there, okay? And they're, they're, they're opposite each other. If I look and see where the radial tuberosity is, the ulnar tuberosity is very, very close. They're just opposite on the, on the ulna as compared to being on the radius, okay? And that's what we see in that proximal ulna. Um, if I go to the distal ulna, I'm going to fall asleep. Boring. Okay. Have all the exciting stuff at, you know, around other, at the distal radius, the distal radius and the ulna. Man, you know, you have to sort of force yourself to stay. This is a time for a lot of caffeine at this point to stay awake. What happens is we have only, only really two major things I want to show you. Here's the head. And this little thing is called the styloid process. If I feel my wrist right here, there's a little bump on the dorsal lateral aspect of my wrist right here, and that's the ulnar styloid, okay? And um, I'll show you, I'll tell you what that's about in a second. We see the same thing here, here's the head, here's the ulnar styloid. What happens is from the ulnar styloid going towards the hand and the carpal bones, which are the those bones on the wrist like we know, there's a ligament, it's called the ulnar collateral ligament. And what that does is it prevents the hand from going too far this way. It limits that, because that once, in fact, if you take your hand, you can actually feel that you can feel the ligament going from that styloid. It's like a little band going right here from the styloid up towards the carpal bones. It just prevents the, the hand from going too far that way. Okay, so that's the distal ulna. Pretty darn boring. Okay, let's talk about the radius. Okay, the radius, here's the radial head. Okay, so we look at the radial head. Here's the radial head. And again, it's a little concave on that surface. Why? Because the capitulum is around. Perfect. Okay, and here's the neck of the radius. This would be the neck of the radius. Here's that radial tuberosity. Okay, so basically that's what we have. So the head, the, the, the head, uh, the disc-shaped head for the articulation with the capitulum. Um, also, uh, I, I mentioned before at the distal humerus uh, laterally, there's also a small depression in the area of the humerus, which is that radial fossa. Okay, for the head, of the, which which it you know, so the head fits inside there. But also, I didn't show this, and I'll show it on another on another picture that comes up a little bit later. On the uh, lateral side of the ulna, there's also another depression, which is also a radial fossa for the head of the radius. So in other words, this part of the head of the radius would be st sitting uh, inside that little fossa. So when it rotates, it has a little gap to rotate in. Okay, so when I flex it that radial head's going to fit in the radial fossa on the humerus. When I rotate it, that little head's going to fit in the radial fossa on the ulna. Okay, but that's about all we have right there. Now, let me just mention something about the, about the, these, these, the, the radial and the uh, ulnar tuberosity. Okay, so let me just draw an ulna here. Okay, an ulna is wide proximally and gets narrow, and a radius is narrow uh, approximately and gets wider it gets wider distally. So right here is going to be the area of the radial tuberosity, and right here would be the area of the ulnar tuberosity. Okay. Now, why is this important? <clears throat> it's important because what happens? There's a muscle in the in the upper arm. Okay. It's called the biceps brachii. Okay. The biceps brachii. Let me just draw it in a darker darker color so you can actually see this. Maybe this not even very good. Let me just do it this way. This might be better. Okay. Okay, we'll draw a bigger line here. Biceps brachii, okay? And the biceps brachii, we know is that big muscle, the biceps muscle that's in the upper portion of the arm. It's probably a, a, the second most powerful uh, elbow flexor. There's a muscle underneath it that's called the brachialis, which is probably even has a better line of pull, okay? Because actually the biceps brachii goes over two joints. It goes across the elbow joint and across goes across the shoulder joint. <clears throat> when we get proximal, 
on the biceps, we end up with a long head that goes up, and that goes to that bicipital groove between that that uh, uh, a greater and the lesser uh, tuberosity or tubercle on the head of the humerus, okay, in that bicipital groove or intertubercular sulcus. We also have a short head of the biceps that comes this way that goes to something else we also talked about before, and that was that coracoid process. But who cares about that? Forget that. I'm talking about down here. What happens is the muscle fibers are coming down this way, okay? And the radius is a rotatory muscle, or is a rotatory bone. It rotates. Flexion of the elbow is at the ulnar <coughs> humeral joint. Rotation, rotation of the forearm is at, <coughs> the, at the, involving the radius, the ulna, and the humerus, okay? The, the ulna does not rotate on the humerus, but the radius rotates on both the humerus and the ulna. <clears throat> but when I get down here at the bottom, at the inferior, most distal portion of the biceps, something very interesting happens, okay? Very interesting. The fibers that are on the lateral, that are on the lateral side, because the radial side, so radial is going to be lateral. Here's the ulnar, which is going to be medial, okay? The fibers on the lateral side cross across to the medial side at the tendon. And then the fibers on the medial side cross across to the lateral side. So they actually form an X in the front of the elbow, in front of the elbow, which is basically, and they attach that area of the ulnar and the radial uh, tuberosity. Now, what, where is that important is when the elbow flexes, it allows that forearm to rotate a little bit, it allows the forearm to rotate medially. Okay, inward, and that's why it, it crosses. So that's just a little nuance. I bet just if you asked a lot of the other A and P people, they wouldn't know, and they'll say, "Oh, who cares?" You know, maybe maybe you don't care either. But anyway, that's that's just about what we see. Okay, that's that's that that radial and the ulnar uh, tuberosity. <clears throat> the distal radius, pretty darn boring as well. Uh, this is this is the dorsal dorsal view or the posterior. This is the anterior view or the ventral view over on this side. Uh, basically, I have the distal radius and I have another styloid. You get, the styloid process of the radius is going to be right here. You know, you might be able to feel a little bit of a bump right here. It's mostly covered over by a bunch of tendons. Okay, and you see the the styloid process here. There's a groove here on the dorsal aspect of the of the of the uh, radius, and that's for the extensor tendons that go to the fingers to make the fingers go up, make the fingers go this way. Okay, so that's that. Um, I, I, maybe you've heard of this, and I and I'll just mention it really quick, and then and then pass on. Uh, have you ever heard of a Collie's fracture? A Collie's fracture is people land on their wrist. And what they do is they get a fracture that goes right across here, just right across the area of the distal radius. And the thing about it is when they fall on the wrist, it takes this part and forces it upwards, or forces it posteriorly. So if this was if this was posterior or the back of the arm, and this was anterior or the front of the arm, front of the forearm, the, the arm would be like this. And where that fracture is, the fracture then gets angled upwards like this. And then the hand comes off of that and comes this way. And so instead of having a, if I looked at this, instead of having a straight line, you know, my forearm and stuff in a straight line, what would happen is at this point of my wrist, my radius would be angled upward, and then my hand would be up in here, okay? And what this looks like is this looks like a fork that's upside down. If you take a fork and let it on the side and look at, you know, put it upside down, it looks like that. So they call this, for the Collie's Fracture, a silver fork deformity. So if you ever see something like that and they bring somebody down to the x-ray department and their, their wrist has a funny shape like that, he said, hey, I don't have to take an x-ray. I know it's a Collie's fracture because it's, you know, actually you're going to have to look at, see where the fracture lines go and see if there's other associated fractures. But that's what we see and it's at right across this portion of the, of the distal radius. All they do is they take it, numb it up, pull it on, Jam it on the ends of those fractures. It, 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 by the way, it, it's just really all these little spikes of bone. So when they pull it out, when they jam it back in, the spikes on the other side sit inside those spikes. And it's usually pretty stable. So they just get in the right position, looks like it's straight, and then they um, put them in a cast. And that's it, you know. And then another eight weeks, they can fall again. Okay, take all those little throw rugs out of the house and stuff like that, so the old people don't fall. You, don't look at me that way. Okay. Anyway, that's what we have with that. It's called silver fork deformity. Uh, again, this is just looking at the radius and the ulna. So here's my radius. Oh, that's that's bad. Here's my radius over here. Here's the ulna over here. We can see the radial head up in here, little disc shape. Here's that radial tuberosity. There's the neck. Here's the head, neck, 
radial tuberosity. Here's my distal radius with radial styloid. And you can't see, this is this is posterior. You can see the, the grooves for the tendon to go posteriorly. Here's my ulna, okay? So basically what we're looking at, this is this is looking at from the looking at from the lateral side, looking from lateral to medial, okay? So here's the trochlear notch right here. Here's the olecranon sitting back in, back in here, okay? And you see this thing right here? That's the radial fossa. Let me let me erase that so you can actually take a look at it now that now you get words. See that little gap there? It looks like a little trough. That's the area where the radial head will sit. So when we rotate the arm, the radial the radial head has a little groove to run in. That's called a radial fossa. Okay. Uh, so if the other view here of of the ulna, here's the the trochlear notch. Here's the olecranon right there. Here's the shaft. Uh, actually, what you actually see right here, I should have shown on this view over here. Here's that area the, of the uh, uh, ulnar tuberosity, which is just opposite the radial tuberosity over here. Here we see distally, we see the ulnar styloid, you know, and basically that's what we have. Big deal. Okay. Some more radiographs that we could see. Okay. And we've seen everything up in here. So we know everything up. So we know all this proximal stuff. Okay. Here's the distal radial joint. Actually, this actually, I didn't, I, I just, I hadn't seen this before, but if you look right here, there's a fracture right there. It looks like there's a little fracture. So somehow they put an x-ray on here with a little fracture. You can see a little fracture line going right through there like that. Let me get that out of there so you don't see that. Okay. Anyway, so that's the distal under the radius and the ulna. I'll show you the wrist a little bit more. <laughs> this is a little bit better. There's that radial styloid. Let me see right here. Okay, um, so here's the radius right here, and this bone right here is called the navicular. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Okay, <laughs> a very significant bone, but other than that, down in here, guess what? Not a whole lot of exciting things. We'll talk more about the hand in a minute. Now, I just mentioned a couple things about the uh, about the uh, uh, humerus radius and the ulna articulation. There are three really three points, okay, where the uh, ulna and the radius come together. Okay. Uh, the head and, and the humerus. The head of the radius, obviously, at the capitulum, we see right here. Here's here's point number one, point one right there. The ulnar notch of the ulna and the trochlea was there, okay? And then you can't see it here very well up here, but you can see where the head of the radius meets the ulna. It would be right in this area right here, and you can see there's that radial fossa radial foss or radial notch that sits right there <clears throat> and that's what we see there so anyway that's all that this is distal you know pretty boring here's the here's the distal radius here's the distal ulna and they come together what did you do okay anyway those are some articulations if we look at the ligaments okay there's not a whole lot that are that's really excited in in the ligaments of the of the elbow joint if i have one bone that meets another bone down here what happens is they have a ligament that comes on one side a ligament that comes on the other side. And those are called collateral ligaments. Collateral. Okay. So you see it right here. Collateral, collateral. The radial collateral ligament goes from the radius to the humerus on the lateral side. The ulnar collateral ligament goes from the ulna to the humerus on the medial side. That's about all there is to it. Okay. Nothing big. We'll see those in the knee. Near the knee. Medial collateral ligament, lateral collateral ligament near the knee. And basically, they're basically collateral. They're on the outside. We talk about this one right here is the ulnar collateral ligament that goes from the ulnar styloid to the arm. Okay. But those are sort of boring. You know, they're not really exciting. We could see, we could actually see here uh, the radial collateral ligament, you know, is, is here. If you see, here's, here's, if you look here, the, here's the radius. Okay. Here's the radius, and you can see how that radius goes to the humerus right there, and that's the radial collateral ligament, okay? Radial collateral ligament going from the radius. Here's the radius to the humerus. The only other one that's really interesting is this one right here, okay? And that's called the annular ligament, annular ligament. What the annular ligament is, let me get rid of this picture of collaterals down here. What the annular ligament really is, is it's, it's nothing more than a sling. It's a sling. It's a lasso. And what that lasso does, it goes around. So the head of the radius is going to be sitting right here. It goes around the, 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 the distal portion of the head and the neck of the radius. And it holds that head in place. And because it's a circle, that the neck of the radius sits right there. So guess what? It can rotate inside that, inside that ring, inside that loop. Okay? There's something that's called a nursemaid's elbow. Okay? And this happens to little kids. 
And what happens is you're walking a kid, you're holding their hand, you're going, and then getting ready to go across the street. The kid starts to step in the street, doesn't look, dumb kid, you know. And all of a sudden, the car's coming around the corner, and, and the mom or the dad grabs him by the arm and yanks the arm. And the kid starts screaming, you know, and stuff like that. Well, sometimes what happens is when I get a quick yank, what it does is it pulls that radial head, which would be that radial head, which would be underneath here. It pulls it out from underneath that annular ligament, or at least partly. Okay, so the kid has trouble rotating their forearm. They just have to pop it back in, put the kid in a sling for a while, and the kid's fine. You know, just don't walk in traffic. That's all. You know, hopefully they'll learn the lesson. And then this is just looking at the elbow joint itself. Everything we've already talked about so far. So let's go on. There's the elbow joint again. You can look at this just more. The more x-rays you look off, the look at that you look at, you know, the better you're going to be. Here's the radial head, radial neck. So you can see there's the neck right here. Here's the disc-shaped head that's concave. Here'd be the area of the capitulum and the trochlea. Okay. You can see the olecranon in here. Okay. Because it says, see, oh, see that word right there? Ooh, capitulum and trochlea superimposed. That's why it looks round and it looks dense. Why? Because you have the capitulum and the trochlea that are both one on top of the other at that point when I'm looking from that direction. Okay. So here's the uh, uh, here's the coronoid uh, fossa would be up in here. The coronoid process. Let me get all this out of the way. Here's the coronoid process. You actually see it pretty well here. See it right there. It comes up like that. Right there. I've outlined it. That's the coronoid process. Uh, here's the uh, radial tuberosity. Here's the ulnar tuberosity sitting right there. Okay, so those are things you should be able to identify if I ever gave an X-ray or something like that. On exam, this is just looking, um, looking uh, at these on a on a, uh, a specimen, a dissected specimen. Okay, and if you can see here, here's the capitulum. Okay, and see how you know why it's so shiny? Because that's cartilage. It's covered with cartilage. Articular cartilage is going to be covering that. See how it's round looking? Okay, here's the trochlea right here. Okay, here's the coronoid process. You can actually see it's coming up that way. Here's that coronoid fossa that's going to go into. Here's the radial fossa for the radial head. Radial head's actually covered over with all the ligament. This is the annular ligament coming across here. It's actually the one we showed before. It's coming across there, so you can't really see the radial head very much. Okay, uh, here would be the uh, uh, medial epicondyle. Here's the lateral epicondyle right there. Okay, so those things you can see. Same thing over here. Here's the ulna. You know, here's the here here'd be the area the area of the trochlea. Here's the olecranon right here. So that's the olecranon, this area right here. Here's the uh, ulnar ulnar tuberosity right there. Here's the radial tuberosity. Here's the radial head. Here's the uh, uh, part of the ulnar collateral ligament. And then you can see where they've actually cut away a little bit of the annular ligament right there. Okay. And this is just a articular a, you know articulated skeletal. Here's the area of the trochlea. Here's the coronoid process right there. Head of the radius, neck of the radius, ulnar tuberosity, radial tuberosity, uh, olecranon, you know, all those things that you've seen before. So let me just go ahead and get rid of these, and you should be able to identify all that stuff. All that stuff now is you should be champions with all that, okay? Shouldn't be any problem at all. A couple other things I should mention about the forearm so I could get to the hand before it gets too late. If I look at the forearm, the forearm, the radius and the ulna are connected in a couple spots, okay? Um, if I look here, okay, uh, all the way in here, they're connected by a membrane, and that membrane is called the interosseous membrane, okay? Interosseous membrane. It connects the radius and the ulna along its most of the forearm, but what happens, it also serves as a site of attachment for muscles. Muscle fibers will actually attach onto this membrane both and it divides the front the anterior from the posterior which is really good okay uh the proximal portion of the head of the radius okay uh, uh sits in that in that little groove and you can actually see it a little bit right here if you look right here where the end of the arrow would be well i keep it on lewis again right there you see how that there's the radial head and there's like a little depression right there and that would be that area of that uh radial fossa on the on the uh, on the ulna where that radio will, will, radio radius would sit there, and then down here distally, it's a pretty darn boring, um, pretty darn boring type of an articulation distally. Okay, and that's it. And then what we happens is then we'll talk about this next is uh, the the radius articulates with this large bone right here, which is called the navicular, and that's going to be coming up very shortly, like right now. When I get down to the hand or to the wrist, okay, the wrist has what are, it's called the carpus. Carpus means wrist, okay, and basically there's eight small bones and they're called the carpal bones. Um, 
it's traditionally it's two rows of four. Some people say it's a row of three and a row of five. I don't really care. It's eight. Four and four is fine with me. And a lot of times they're named by what their shape looks like. Okay. And we'll go. We'll talk to them about uh, by 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 name. Okay. And we'll, we'll, by row. Okay. Um, but what happens is the all these little little bones they're actually held together very tightly by small intercarpal ligaments. Very very small ligaments that attach one carpal to the next carpal. There's not much movement between the carpals. Are very very, very narrow between the um, the radius and the navicular there's a there's actually a, um, a cartilaginous uh, disc that sits in there but it, there's not much between there's a very small disc very small uh, cartilage between those but we have all these little ligaments that, that sort of bind all these all these you know all the carpal bones together so there's not much motion from one carpal bone to the next okay Let's talk about that proximal row. There's only a couple carpal bones that I think are, are really exciting for me. Okay. Now the first one is really exciting, and that's this bone right here. This bone right here is called the navicular or the scaphoid. Uh, scaphoid means boat-like. And if I looked at it from the side, it would be like this. This area right here is this area of the depression right here. Okay. Um, and, and it's it's uh, it's it's the most commonly fractured bone in the carpals. Okay, by far, you know, there are a couple the, the, the hamate will break and a couple other ones may break, but the, the, the most common fracture is going to be the scaphoid. I mean, I've seen tons of people with scaphoid fractures. I remember I was working, I used to work for Ignatius as a team doc. Uh, for hockey and lacrosse, and one of my lacrosse players was a football player. He was a defensive uh, 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 defensive lineman for the football team. He was a goalie on the on the on the lacrosse team and a defensive lineman. And just before the state championship game, the last game, uh, they had a practice, and he was sitting on the back of somebody's car, and they started the car, and the car took off and he fell off and landed on his wrist and uh like two days before the state championship game he broke his navicular okay well he played they put him in a playing cast they play in the if you ever see somebody that has a cast that goes up to the tip of their thumb okay it's go up and say i bet you i know what you have okay and you can bet him a lot of money if you want and you'll say i bet you don't yes i do i bet you have a fractured navicular Darn it! And they have to pay you because it, 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 it was called a thumb, thumb spike. It goes all the way up to the tip of the fingers, okay? And because they have to control all the way out to the end of the fingers for that for that bone to heal. Here's the problem with this bone: the navicular has a has a, a bad history with it. it. It has a bad history simply because it has a really crazy blood supply, okay? If I look at the most blood supply, most blood supply goes from proximal to distal. Navicular says, no, nah, I want to be different. What happens is it gets a blood supply coming from distal going proximal, like that. Okay, so the blood's going past it and comes back, almost like it forgot it in the first place. Well, here's the problem. When this bone fra fractures, it fractures right in the middle. It's called the waist, right across here. This bone is frequently misdiagnosed, okay? Someone will fall on their wrist, they go to the x-ray, go to the x-ray department, somebody takes an x-ray, the the uh, emergency room doc, who's also maybe a dermatologist or something like that, I hope nobody's related to a dermatologist, no no offense there, but they don't look at as many as x-rays. But what happens, a guy says, uh, oh, it looks fine, I don't see anything there, and uh, it turns out that uh, uh, six months later, they're having all kinds of pain, they, they're, 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 their wrist is getting stiffer. Well, what happens is, if you looked at the um, the video in regards to bone healing, the most important thing about bone healing is for it to happen. I have to get a callus that a, uh, like a hematoma or a clot that actually forms between the two pieces of bone. The bone's broken down the middle. I need a clot between. Why? Because it creates a matrix in which I could start to build capillaries, little blood vessels across. Why? I need to have those capillaries to bring in fibroblasts to start to lay down new bones, or actually bring in osteoclasts. First of all, to be able to uh, just absorb the old bone, and then osteoblasts, which are basically specialized fibroblasts, to come down and lay down new bone. Okay. So what happens is, if if it's missed, they give them an ACE wrap or something like that, and as a result. Every time they move the wrist, they break up all that little clot. Think about it. If you have a scab on your knuckle, every time you bend your knuckle, the scab breaks. Well, if they, if this area right here, where that fracture is, is not immobilized, that's why they put that, that cast all the way out to the tip of the thumb. Okay? Sometimes they'll actually put a screw down in there. But um, if it's not immobilized, that fracture fragment moves. So they can't build the capillaries across that area. As a result, the bone eventually starts to die, and this part of the bone down here dies 
right at the wrist. So therefore, they get wrist stiffness, a lot of wrist pain. And then when they go back six months later, they get an X-ray and they say, oh, my gosh, you probably had a fracture. Oh, no, I had a sprain. The doctor told me I had a sprain. Guess what? He is wrong. You had a fracture. OK, they actually get a special X-ray because it because of superimposition. If they just get a typical wrist X-ray, it's very difficult to see the navicular well. They actually rotate it around just a little bit to be able to get a better view. It's called a navicular view. OK, anyway, so what happens is I'm going to tell you something right now. OK, and I want you to take this to the bank. OK, and I want you to to to, to believe it. OK, let's get rid of all these lines here. When a bone dies, when a bone dies. When a bone dies. What happens to it? Well, it dies. When I look at it on an x-ray, the bone will look white. The bone looks really white. It gets really dense. And that bone gets very, very dense. It's called aseptic necrosis. A means without, septic means, you know, you know, it's not infected. Necrosis, it's dead, okay? And what happens is, when you think about bone, bone's a mixture of organic and inorganic materials. The inorganic materials, that hydroxyapatite, the calcium and stuff like that, which give it the whiteness. The organic material is like everything else, like ligament and everything, which gives it a little bit more darkness. So what happens is when the organic material dies because it doesn't get a blood supply, that bone will start to become, all that, all that organic material gets taken away, gets absorbed, it's gone. So all that's left is the crystalline material, the hydroxyapatite, and that's what gives that bone the whiteness. So as a result, dead bone is white bone. White bone is dead bone. Think about that. White bone is dead bone, except if it's cortical bone, you know, which is normally supposed to be white. But if it's not supposed to be white, if it's supposed to be sort of like a grayish, you know, somewhere in between, and it's white, bone's dead. Sorry about that. It's gone. Da 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 da. You know, it's, it's that's it. Okay. So anyway, that's the navicular. If you actually uh, take your hand, okay. And take your thumb and move your thumb out this way, and, and you'll, you'll see these two tendons that run right here in there. Take your finger and stick it right in the middle of it, right here at your wrist line. Guess what's underneath that? That's the navicular. So in other words, if somebody has tenderness down there, okay, even if the X-ray looks negative, people will probably stick them in a cast if they're if they're at all smart to come back two weeks later to see if some of that bones resorb because of osteoclast going in and taking an old bone, like we talked about in, in fracture healing, which is in the third osteo. Uh, you know, osteology three. It's in that 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 video if you haven't seen that. Okay. So anyway, that's the navicular. Let's get out of the navicular. Next bone we have is this bone down here, and this bone right here is called the lunate. It's called the lunate because it's moon shaped. It sort of has like an angle to it, like this. As a result, what happens? It's like more like a piece of pie, you know, and what a pizza, 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 you know, a slice of pizza. What happens is when you fall on the wrist, sometimes it actually dislocates. It very rarely fractures, but usually pops right back in. You know why? Because all those ligaments are tight. So that's that. Let's get rid of these. So that's called the lunate. You know, it does dislocate. The next bone we have is called the triquetrum. Now, this one's sort of like covered up. It's sitting right back in here, okay? It's, it's a little bit bigger than that because this bone right here is sitting on top of it. This bone that sits on top of it is called the pisiform, okay? If you take your hand and you feel right here, just where you see the wrist crease, you feel right there, there's a little bump right there on the, on the palmer side, that's the pisiform. That's the pisiform, okay? And it's like, it's pisiform because it's P-shaped. It's P-shaped, okay? And it sits on top. That's all. It's connected. It's, it's tied down by ligament, okay? And what it does, it sits on top of the triquetrum. Sometimes they consider the pisiform in that second row or the distal row, okay? But so we have the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetrum, and the pisiform. Nothing much happens with the triquetrum, which is down there. The second row, the first two, who cares, okay? Trapezium. Trapezium right here, two sides, no two sides parallel, and then we have the trapezoid, and the trapezoid is right here. Not very exciting. Third bone is a little bit exciting, and that's this bone right here, and this bone right here is called the capitate. Cap sits where? On your head. Well, guess what? This bone has a head right here. This area right here is the head of the capitate. It's the largest of the carpal bones, okay? It's pretty pretty good size. I actually put one on a table once for a group of students, and they thought it was actually a, a, a phalanx, 
you know, and it wasn't. It was the capitate. They should have known that. Okay, a different shape. Okay, but anyway, uh, it, it, it's it's a large bone and it has a rounded head, and that's why they call it the capitate. Sort of a, a good bone. It's it's one that should be easily identified. But the one here that is really the one that I really sort of I think is cool. Okay, is this bone right here? This bone right here is called the hamate. Now it's really, it's called, the, and the reason why it's cool is because this little area right there is a hook. So if the body of the hamate was here, they have a hook that comes out like this, out from the hamate, okay? And that hook is used for something called the carpal tunnel, which I'll talk about in a minute, okay? It sticks out. Now, um, I, I, I like a lot of sports. So I played a little bit of everything. I played hockey, I played baseball. I tried playing basketball, but you know, at, at five, six, it didn't do very good. Um, you know, a little football, a little bit of everything, you know, uh, even picked up a lacrosse stick and threw the ball around with lacrosse, lacrosse stick, no golf. No, no, it's for, that's for old men, but I'm, and I'm still too young. I'm 70 and I'm still too young. Okay. But anyway, um, sorry if you're a golfer, but eh, it's my fan. Anyway, so anyway, um, I, 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 my, but I like a lot of sports. My favorite sports will probably be going to be uh, hockey is probably my favorite. Uh, baseball and football, they come in a really close second. And lacrosse is right there in that in that group. Basketball, it's down the road. You know, it's I like it, but I'm not crazy about it. It's OK. I, I before the um, before the covid, I had I went to every game. I was there all the time. OK, I, went, I, I didn't miss a game all the way through um, that they when they canceled the season so far. I was at every game at the Cavs game. But hey, that's the way it works. And um, but anyway, uh, my, my favorite to play was always baseball. I was always better at baseball. I was a catcher in college. And what happens is sometimes if you see a batter, they'll be hitting and all of a sudden they'll, they'll, their hand, what will happen is the bat gets jammed right against that hook in this area right there and they may break it off. OK. Uh, who was it a couple of years ago or that two years ago? I think it was maybe yeah, last year. I forget. Had a, you know, I mean, it's not you. Oh, Ramirez. Ramirez had a fractured hook of the hamate. And what they frequently have to do is, is because it, it's small, they will just drill a little hole and put a very small screw in, but then they can't do anything because they got to wait for that, that bone to heal with that little screw in there. Okay. It's important because again, it's a, it's a site of what's called the transverse carpal ligament. I'll talk about that in just a minute. OK, uh, again, just a couple fun facts for you to share with your friends and family and neighbors. Um, capitates the largest, has a round of protect, pro, uh, projection, uh, which articulates with the lunate. And that largest projection is that head, that rounded area. OK, the hamate has a hook on the palmar aspect, which sometimes gets fractured. OK, uh, the concavity formed by the pisiform and the hamate on the other side and the scapegoat and the tra a trapezium on the radial side provide the bed for what's called the carpal tunnel. And I'll show you what the carpal tunnel is in just a minute. Uh, the roof of the carpal tunnel is covered over by a ligament, which is called the flexor retinaculum of the transverse carpal ligament. And the long tendons go underneath. OK, let's just look at some of these. Let's just uh, add uh, this is if we if we start to look at here's my navicular my scaphoid right there. OK, uh, here is my lunate. OK, here's my capitate right there. Here's my hamate. You can actually see the hook. There's the hook right there. OK, uh, here's the trapezium. Here's the trapezoid right there. Here's the triquetrum sitting on there. And then here's my good old friend, the pisiform sitting right there. OK, so we're looking on the uh, the volar side or the palmar side on that. This over here is on the on the on the posterior side. And basically, here's the part of the part of the navicular. It's the navicular right there. And this is that waist area we talked about, that little narrow area in the waist. Here's the lunate right there. OK, uh, here's the hamate right there. OK. Uh, here's the triquetrum. You can't see the pisiform because it's on the other side. Here's the capitate sitting right there. Okay. Uh, here's the trapezium. Here's the trapezoid. Okay. So basically, that's what we see. Now, I mentioned the carpal tunnel a minute ago. Okay. If I look from the the lateral side where we talked about the hook of the hamate and stuff like that, and the and the pisiform, it creates from that point over to the area of the navicular. OK, the navicular and the trapezium on this side, there's a band and that's that band right here. Let me just do it in a different. Let me do it in black to start out with black right here. And that's called the transverse carpal ligament, transverse carpal ligament. OK, uh, or the flexor retinaculum, transverse carpal ligament or flex, flexor retinaculum. And if I look underneath it, you know, I see all these these white things running under. Whoop, they're white. Now they're purple You're running underneath. 
Let me get rid of that. Okay. All those white bands, those are the tendons from the from the from the muscles that flex my fingers. But you know what? That's not where the problem is. The problem is right here. This area right here. That area right there is the median nerve, and that median nerve passes underneath it. And what you see is that median nerve, once it passes underneath there, it sends out a branch that goes to the thumb here, this goes to this finger, this finger, and this part of this finger. Okay? What that median nerve does is, first of all, people with carpal tunnel, if you know, when they pull their hand back like that, they get a shooting pain that goes down their palm, and it, it, they get a lot of pain in, in the palm region. Okay? Um, we also find that people, with, they, they have a numbness of the thumb, index, middle, and this side of the ring finger. With that ulnar nerve, remember it was this side, but the, the, this side, the, the, the thumb side of the, of the ring finger. But they also have a numbness of the, of the muscles right here. These are called the thenar muscles. These muscles get very numb. They have a difficult time in, in doing what we call apposition, like opposing their fingers like that. They can't pull their thumb across because this muscle becomes very weak and atrophic. It starts to wear down. Okay. So that's a little bit. And all they do for that, all they do for that is they cut the transverse carpal ligament and leave it like that, leave it open. So it takes the pressure off the, off the ulnar nerve. Or the immediate median nerve, excuse me. This is just another X-ray. Here's the here's the navicular. Here's the lunate. You know, here is the uh, triquetrum. You can see a little bit of the pisiform. You know, uh, like sitting behind it right there. Here's the capitate. Here's the hamate. And this is actually sort of cool because you see right there, there's the hook of the hamate. See that little whitish area right there. Here's the trapezoid and the trapezium right here. Okay, so you can see all those bones. I'd go back and I'd look at all these. You can see those all pretty easily. Okay, those are probably all easily identifiable. Here we go again. This is just a little bit more of, of, a, of a different view. Okay, uh, here's the scaphoid navicular. Scaphoid navicular work this, are, are, are both the same thing. Here's the trapezoid and the trapezium right here. Okay, you can see the hamate over here, not as well. Uh, we can see the, uh, let's see, the triquetrum right here. And uh, pisiform, you actually see sort of tucked in there. Not as good. You can't see them really as well as the other one. Let me just talk about the metacarpals. Metacarpals are, num are numbered one through five. One through five. One, uh, let me do it this way. One, two, three, four, five. One through five, okay? Um, and basically, um, that's, that's, that, that's all they are. They have a base. They have a shaft and they have a distal head. They have, guess what they call it a head? Because it's round at the end. <laughs> Go figure, okay? Uh, the bases articulate with the distal row of the carpals, okay? And that's called the carpal metacarpal joint. Think about this. If, if they name a joint, okay, um, they, all you do is name wh where they're coming from and where it's going to. It starts at the carpals and goes to the metacarpal, so why not call it the carpal metacarpal joint? Duh, it's pretty simple, okay? And then the heads articulate with the bases of the proximal phalanges. We'll talk about that in a second. I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, all, and then when they attach to there, it's called the metacarpal phalangeal joints. Why? Because now the metacarpals are meeting a phalanx, so it's metacarpal phalangeal joint. So carpal metacarpal joint between the carpals and the metacarpals and the carpal metacarpal phalangeal joint from the metacarpals to the, to the phalanges. Piece of cake, easy, okay? And that's what we're talking about. Here's that rounded head area. This area is the shaft area or the diaphysis and the base. Space is relatively flat, okay? And it basically articulates with that distal row of, of the uh, uh, of, the, of the carpal bones. Uh, we talked about sesamoid bones. It's not unusual to have two little sesamoid bones underneath the thumb, okay? Usually they're cartilage. They, they're, you, you, uh, you may see them radiographically. If you do, don't say, oh my gosh, what's going on here? It's, they're pretty, they're normal, but most of the time they're cartilage. But, so this would be one, two, three, four, five, okay? Phalanges. Phalanges, phalanx means battle line. If you have, a, if you were, uh, uh, like, I, I like to, I think one of the things I'd like to do, and this is a little bit being maybe of a little bit of a history nerd, you know, hit, I, I've been to Gettysburg, I've been to Antietam, but it'd be nice to go to a lot of the, you know, a lot of the uh, Civil War battlefields just to go see what they are. And what they did in a battle, in, in the Civil War, what they did is they lined people up in little groups like that, and they lined another group up behind them, okay, and then not another group up behind them in a phalanx in lines, battle lines, and they'd start to march forward. When all these guys were gone, these guys would step up. So guess what? You just hope you weren't in the first line that day. I'd say, I could take a picnic back here for a while, which would be great, okay? But the phalanges are basically the fingers, okay? And basically the fingers are numbered one, two, three, four, five. Thumb would be one, two, three, four, little fingers, five. Or the proper thing is thumb, index, middle, ring, and little. 
Okay, that's appropriate medical term. Appropriate medical term. Thumb, index, middle, ring, little. Also, another name for the thumb is pollux. Pollux. So if you see pollux somewhere, or a lot of times the, the muscles that go to the thumb will be pollicis something. Pollicis. Okay, so pollux or pollicis means thumb. Means thumb. And again, when we look at that, we have uh, in here's the here's the index finger, here's the middle, here's the ring, here's the little, here's the thumb. Okay. And if we look, I have one, two, three. That's a three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Whoops. One, two, which gives me fourteen. Okay. So fourteen phalanges. They have a base which is pretty flat. Or a little concave actually in most of these a little, a little concave base in here and that fits the rounded convex head of the metacarpal okay um and that's what we have they call this one right here the proximal interphalangeal joint and they call this one the distal interphalangeal joint okay sometimes they call it dipj or dij or pip J, proximal interphalangeal joint, okay? And then this here is just called an interphalangeal joint on the thumb. So that's an interphalangeal I, P, J, okay? That's what we have. There's usually a little groove also right here. If you look at the the, the, the planner or the, the palmer aspect of the bases, these little groove for the flexor tendon to run up through that groove. The, I'll tell you what, we could spend a, a ton of time just talking about the, what's called the uh, extensor wing apparatus, but we ain't got time. We'd be here until uh, uh, summer of uh, 2023. So we won't do that, we'll wait, okay? So anyway, those are the joints that are there. And this is just looking at what we see. Here's, here's the thumb index, middle, ring, little and and what happens is there's the proximal phalanx middle phalanx distal phalanx proximal phalanx middle phalanx distal phalanx proximal phalanx distal middle phalanx distal phalanx proximal phalanx middle phalanx distal phalanx and they just call this one proximal and distal one thing about the uh, uh, distal phalanx the distal phalanx is like it looks like a little top hat it comes like this Looks like a little tree or a top hat sits on there. And this is called the distal tuft. A lot of times when people get a little fracture of the finger, at the tip of the finger they get hit, this area of fractures. A lot, and the, the skin is so tight around there, it hurts like the dickens and it's, it throbs and stuff like that. But this is just looking, here's the heads, the metatar metatarsal, or the metacarpals. Here is the proximal phalanx, proximal phalanx, proximal phalanx. You can, and you could also, if you get a chance, look at all the carpals and try to figure out the carpals. Okay, this is just radiographically one, two, three, four, five for the metacarpals, and we can see the proximal, middle, and distal phalanx of those, all the distal interphalangeal joint, proximal interphalangeal joint, metacarpal phalangeal joint, as well as you can see all the carpals that we talked about before. Okay, so hopefully that will fill you in on everything. Again, you can always stop these and stop the video and just go over things, and, and you know, that's, that's perfectly fine. So what did we talk about today? We finished the arm. Okay, the upper extremity. We talked about uh, the elbow and the articulation between the, the radius and the uh, humerus at the uh, uh, capitulum and the radial head. We talked about the articulation between the, the humerus and the ulna, you know, at the trochlea. Okay, we talked about uh, various fosses around the elbow that are important because what happens is when I flex and extend, I have to have things to go in. Okay, so they don't keep on bulging out. We talked about the distal radius and distal ulna. Okay, boring stuff. Okay, then we talked about the carpals. I think the carpals are, are, are easy to figure out. They're, they actually have an older names. And I, I think everywhere I've ever gone, people have worked some type of a, a little phrase. Okay, uh, however, I would tell you some of those phrases that I've heard in the past, but I'm afraid I can't tell you that because I'd probably be in jail. So I'm not going to tell you. You can figure it out yourself. There's a lot of them that there are actually a little bit, uh, uh, not even a little bit, some of them are really cool pretty risque so I'm not gonna say any of those I just for the for the for the purpose of, of good taste I'm not gonna say any of those you can figure that out uh, metacarpals and flanches we've talked about that so hopefully this fills you in on a lot of that anatomy again go back and look at all you need it and uh, get that all down because this is what your bread and butter is going to be
Again, if you have any questions, make sure you let me know. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you might have. And if you, in for now, I'm going to say, again, be safe and be healthy, and we'll see you next time.